Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Thank you for joining us. The, the purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts and topics being used in current media and compare its essence with the usage and circumstances in how they are being used. The format of the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement and will suggest, have uh, comments and explanations after the opening statement. And so we commence with the subject of this week's issue, which is gauging the Fed's impact, which is the title of an article by John Hilsenrath in the Wall Street Journal on March 22nd of this year, entitled, Fed hosts global gathering on easy money. The world's leading central bankers gathered on March 5th to discuss and gauge the impact of their easy money policies, including whether the controversial bond buying strategy known as quantitative easing is a good weapon to keep in their monetary arsenals. The article states that, quote, quantitative easing, or QD, refers to central bank purchases of long-term bonds or other securities to drive down long-term interest rates and drive up the prices of other assets, such as stocks. It is an alternative to the traditional tool of lowering or raising short-term interest rates. Central banks, including the Fed, the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan, have used the approach because short-term interest rates are stuck near zero and cannot be moved much lower to support growth." Unquote. However, the article states that, quote, critics say these policies are doing more harm than good because they cause inflationary pressure without helping grow growth, cramping household spending power. Some worry, for example, that the policies are pushing up commodity prices. Even many of those who are sympathetic to quantitative easing as a necessary measure when conventional policy is impossible, worry about its costs and benefits." Unquote. Further, the article notes that the Fed has reinvented its communication policy and said it would keep short-term interest rates low until late 2014. Well, the philosophical angle needs to explicate this matter. First, we must note that economists in general, most notably among them Milton Friedman, have noticed that inflation is caused by adding fiat paper money to any economy. Further, they note that inflation is bad because a dollar that you worked for today will be worth less later over time. Thus. The money of people who save will be worth less in the future than in the present. So as to their purpose in gathering to gauge it to the impact of their easy money policies, let us ask, how have they done? Good job? Effective? What did they accomplish? Anything? 
let's have the philosophical angle examine the situation to answer their own inquiry. To begin, let's list the troubles that these central bankers encountered. First, the Lehman Brothers collapse presented the economy with the stark reality that there was a housing mortgage crisis caused by the government back in 2008. The government initiated policies that made it easy for almost anybody to borrow money to buy a house through the Community Development Act. This led to many to receive credit to buy their homes who ultimately could not pay for the mortgage. Investors who own these mortgages suddenly realized that they have assets that were worth less than they thought. Secondly, the economy went into recession with the help of this housing mortgage crisis. Thirdly, the economy stays in recession for at least two years. Fourthly, the economy seems to have started to mend itself. So, here is the scorecard. First, as mentioned, the mortgage market collapsed as precipitated by the government actions. The Fed, in working with the Department of the Treasury, concocts the TARP program, which transfers money to banks to cover their positions of mortgage-backed securities. And that is, the Fed transfers money to the banks that have these mortgages that suddenly are worth less than originally thought. This action was to prevent a probability that the banks would go bankrupt, causing a financial panic, which would jeopardize the, pro the progression of commerce. It would seem that the Fed, along with the U.S. Treasury, acted in a prudent manner relative to this TARP program. Of course, there are some consequences, namely inflation, developing whenever money is added to, an, to an, an economy. But since the amount of TARP was less than $1 trillion, if there were no further money added, over time, economic growth would cause the TARP dollars to be absorbed into the economy, mitigating the potential effects of the probability of inflation. Taking the perspective of the risk, which was the great, uh, uh, the great risk of the economy being hit with the sudden realization that the mortgages were not only worth a fraction of what they were originally, and that this could cause a financial collapse, a, a sudden deposit of money to cover the, this great risk was a prudent action. Conclusion, TARP was a good thing. Score, we give it an A. Well done, Paulson, Bush, Bernanke. However, since this initial injection of money into the system, the Fed has continued to add further money into the banking system by buying mortgages and other bonds from the banks. They do that by printing up some money and then go to the banks and buy their loan mortgage portfolios, thereby adding money to the commerce of our society. The question here is why they continued this ongoing injection of money into the U.S. economy. The answer is twofold. First is that the Fed has an additional mandate. Besides being the caretaker of the currency, they have the mandate of promoting employment. Seemingly, at least for the present, the Fed fulfills this mandate by adding excess liquidity, that is printing money, to the banking system, hoping that banks will lend that money to commerce. 
The danger inherent with this further and greater supply of money is inflation, which is causing your money to be worth less. The second reason is that politicians can influence the Fed's actions. And as we are in a recession and the Democratic politicians do not want to be voted out of office, they're looking for some way to get this recession to end. One of the ways is to influence the Fed to print more money in hopes that it will stimulate the economy as we just discussed. However, the philosophical angle believes that this is a partial failure and will ultimately become a detrimental policy. The reason is that it is a partial success is because the amount of junk mortgages that the government originally underwrote and guaranteed through Fannie and Freddie was greater than originally thought, and the government owes the private sector for what it wrought. Fed scorecard on this point, we'll give it a C. Now, we need to ask ourselves, as we discussed here, is the nature of inflation. And so, we're going to go to our board and we'll discuss the nature of inflation and we'll find out that there are two types of inflation. Let's go to the board. First type of inflation is that is what is known and predicted by every economist and every textbook. That type of inflation is when you add money to an economy and you add dollars and currency, the more dollars you add, the value of a single dollar naturally becomes less. So, and let's go into that now in detail so we have a clear understanding of it. And even before we get to that, let's review a little something about an economy. Everything that you do in life is a sacrifice. When you go to the store to buy groceries, you're sacrificing your effort to go to the store to get groceries so that you can eat and feed your family and, 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 uh, and, and, and feel good and be healthy. And, when you, and so when you do this, you sacrifice your effort, you sacrifice your time amidst the risk And you employ your knowledge and information. And how do we do this? You employ your knowledge and information because you know the way to the store, you know prices, you know, you know how to shop, you know, how to, uh, you, you know the, the, uh, what to get, what your family likes. So there's lots of information that goes into making that decision. You spend your time. You spend uh, your effort, your physical effort to go there. And it's risky. You have to drive. You could get into an accident. So in everything that you do, and, and uh, whether you go to the grocery store or whether you go to work, you have these four variables always present. And the and, and economy is no different. So when you go to work, In an atmosphere of risk, you spend your time, you spend your effort, and you use your information and knowledge to make this equation. So at work, we sacrifice our effort, our time, our effort and information to produce things. And that production has a value. 
And that value can be made up of, of, of the currency, of dollars. So, our value of a dollar, we will say, equals risk, time, effort, information, prime. And so that will be the value of one dollar. So if we take the total production of our risk, time, effort, and information, and knowledge, and we divide that by risk, time, effort, information, prime, we get the number of dollars, number of dollars in circulation, and we call that X. So, if we take X and we divide it into the total production of all our risk of, of everybody's transactions throughout our, history, uh, throughout our United States economy, and our total of uh, time and effort and knowledge, and we divide it by the total number of dollars, we get the value of one dollar. And so, if we've written it down as an equation, we can see that if we add, if we increase the number of dollars, you're going to get a decrease on the other side of the equation, and that decrease is in the, the value of the single dollar. <clears throat> and what happens if the value of the single dollar decreases, you, as a saver, your value of what you have saved goes down also. So essentially, when the Fed does this, it's robbing your savings. Societies and governments have a pension for printing money and taking your money away. So we need to be careful. The Fed especially needs to be careful. But I mentioned there are two types of inflation. So what is the second type of inflation? The second type is if this value of, the, of our total production changes. If this value of the total production changes, then if we add a, a, a greater number of dollars into the equation, it, the value of the, of, of the individual dollar <coughs> can remain the same. That is, if the total production increases, and how we do that. We do that by making this more efficient. We reduce the risk, reduce the time, reduce the effort, and increase our knowledge. So if, if, if we make these more valuable, more efficient, then the economy at home, a, and whole produces more with less, and thus your number of dollars, or thus the value of the individual dollar increases. So, let us look at the individual equation again, <clears throat> because the time and effort that you spend, your days are probably pretty full as they are. You've got about as much, you've probably allocated about as much time as you can to work, you're probably uh, spending at work, uh, you're probably giving it your all, and so your effort is, is maxed out. And you don't want to increase your risk or uh, that's natural. So the real variable here is the information complex that we produce, that we as America produces. When information and knowledge increases, its result is to make our sacrifice more efficient, and thus our production more efficient, and the value of the production will increase. And this is how we can fight inflation, too. And let me give you an example. The TV set, when it first came out, was very costly. But due to, the na due to the increase in knowledge of how to produce them, they've not only gotten better, but they've gotten cheaper relative to the value of the dollar at that time and to now. Along with everything else in your household, the refrigerator, Hugely expensive when it first came out, hugely better equipped now, more efficient, and cost less. And that's all due to the greater knowledge of how to produce these things. 
And so when we increase knowledge and information in our society and apply it to, to our sacrifice by which we produce, it raises the value of the equation. And that in itself will, will keep inflation down, even if we add dollars to it. So, in conclusion, it is knowledge that our society produces and what is what made individual, our individual, our society of, 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 of individual exceptionalism prosper over the last 200 years. And for us as a society, then we should be committed to allow for us to develop in our children, to increase their knowledge. So the educational system is very important, but also is not only must the uh, educational and, and knowledge be increased in individuals, but also the incentive for them to use knowledge to make your sacrifice more efficient. That also needs to be present. And so I think we've now come to a a conclusion and, uh, of our summary of the two types of inflation. One that every, all, all economists know, and the one that not so many are cognizant of, in that inflation can also be controlled by the increase of knowledge, which increases the efficiency of the economic transaction. But the, you can g gather ins uh, such insights here at the Philosophical Angle. And so thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.